Okay, go. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so, constructing the satanic witch. Uh, one of these words is very important, and unfortunately, it's not the cool words like satanic or witch, but it's that first word, constructing. Because it could easily read reconstructing. Historians do not reconstruct anything. It's all construction because we don't have all the pieces. So any historian that tells you that she or he is reconstructing the past is lying to you. But you're an awesome crowd, so I'm not going to do that. Um, what I mean by that is historians use the same kinds of methodologies as a chemist would use, in that we don't uh, come to our conclusions first and then reverse engineer everything to suit it. Although I guess some historians do that, but I'm not going to do that. The difference between a chemist and a historian is that Historians cannot reproduce history in a laboratory. I can't put the Battle of Gettysburg into a test tube and have all the right controls and, oh, that's what happened, and mark off things as they happen. I can't do that. So we are always constructing the past. All of us, every historian does this. So this entire talk is admittedly going to be my construction of how I think some theologians might have probably conceived of the satanic witch. Might probably think, yeah, that covers my ass. <laughs> so that's how, uh, that's how these work. So this satanic witch has been reproduced many times throughout history and art. Uh, for example, starting in the... Uh, no. <laughs> Do I have to put the thingy back? Oh, what did I? Oh, because the, the, the space thing died. Okay, so this is one of, thank you, this is why we have, we have smart people like Ben in the world, and so people like me can be ridiculous, and uh, they'll keep the world together, all together for us. Um, this is one of the earliest imaginings of witches coming together to worship the devil in the form of a goat. The devil was always said to take on different animal forms, but the goat seemed to stick for a variety of reasons, one of which had to do apparently with the size of the genitalia. And as... That's the wrong way. Oh no. <laughs> ben! <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Oh god. <laughs> do I have this back? Yes! I had it back for a second. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm such a disgrace on our generation. <laughs> so, so the, uh, the goat was it because of the virilia of the goat. Um, it was said to be larger than others. And as we move forward in history, you still retain the goat head, but it t tends to take on more of a human body. And slowly but surely, that the, the goat side of it disappears through history leaving us this from Fantasia, the, the Night on Bald Mountain scene, which is one of my favorite pieces of music, like, ever. I love that piece of music. Um, getting us into the 1920s with a German film called Hexen, which is what this is a screenshot from. And we have the, the devil there and holding the child and about to be sacrificed and the witches all around um, beforehand. Now, this is the pictorial representation of the stereotypical or satanic witch. The satanic witch is the stereotypical witch. It's the same thing. So, the stereotypical witch had certain attributes to her. Uh, it was, as time went on, it was always a woman. The stereotypical witch is specifically a female. Yet at the time that this was all being put together, men practiced magic every bit as much as women did. But the misogyny kicked in, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. So this is our stereotypical witch. Uh, she flies through the air, usually on a broom, covered with an ointment made out of children's blood, at least according to the Malleus Multicarum, which was one of the more famous... Uh, witch treatises of uh, really back then and today. Uh, it was just as popular back then, mostly because it coincided with the invention of the printing press. And it was the second highest selling book behind the Bible. 
um, in those days. And today it appears in all the History Channel documentaries, National Geographic, it's even in the Da Vinci Code. Um, anyway, so this uh, stereotypical witch flies to a Sabbath, which is this demonic con congregation overseen by the devil, who has a thing for glow sticks. And while she is there, uh, she will renounce Christianity. This is done by pissing or defecating or stomping on a cross that's put before her feet. She won't just renounce Christianity, but she will sell her soul to the devil. She will learn Maleficio, which is evil or harmful magic. Uh, also, real quick, I'm a guinea from New York, so if I talk too fast, just tell me to slow down. Um, Maleficio are things like uh, making pregnant women miscarry, <coughs> making men impotent, um, raising storms to destroy crops, poisoning cattle. Anything an agrarian society would feel anxiety about, that's what Maleficio is. The stereotypical witch was also a cannibal. She would sit down to this large feast of murdered children and drink chalices overflowing with their blood. Finally, she would copulate with demons. So when we talk about the satanic witch or the stereotypical witch, that's what she is. A woman who flies through the air, renounces Christianity, worships the devil, learns magic, drinks blood, and fornicates with demons. I once threw a party <laughs> that was pretty similar to this. <laughs> um, this particular stereotype, believe it or not, begins centuries before the 1400s, which is when we start to see the beginnings of the stereotypical witch. Uh, around the 1430s, I, I give, given a talk here twice on really narrowing down the dates and how that happened, uh, but it's, it's all in the book as well. And, um, but this is a little different. This stereotype begins in ancient Greece and Rome, before there was even a such thing as Christianity. It begins with the insurgent stereotype. The insurgent stereotype was a way that politicians would demonize insurgents or terrorists. This practice of, of a terrorist trying to overthrow the state always involved saying libations, or, or excuse me, drinking libations rather, of blood mixed with wine among the, um, the terrorists, so to speak. Um, and it reads something like this. There was a guy named Apollodorus of Cassandria who was recorded by Diodorus of Sicily. Oop. Backwards again, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it reads something like this. Apollodorus aimed at tyranny and to render this conspiracy secure, invited a young lad, one of his friends, to a sacrifice, slew him as an offering to the gods, and gave his fellow conspirators the vitals of this young man to eat. And then he mixed the blood of this young man into wine and bade them drink it. It wasn't just Apollodorus, but anybody. There was another conspiracy uh, known as the Catiline Conspiracy, where it was recorded that Catiline at the time, uh, excuse me, it was said at the time that when Catiline, after finishing his address, compelled the participants in his crime to take an oath, he passed around bowls of human blood mixed with wine, that when the traitors all had tasted it, as is usual in solemn rites, he disclosed his project. And his end in so doing was, they say, that they might be more faithful to one another because they shared the guilty knowledge of so dreadful a deed. So this is what pagan Rome said about any group that they found to be terrorists. And it came as no surprise then when around the year 30 of the Common Era, 40 of the Common Era, they threw this same stereotype onto that newest threat to the Roman Empire, those terrorists known as Christians. Manichius Felix was himself a Christian who records as a kind of satire and parody these slanders. And he wrote, As for the initiation of new members, the details are as disgusting as they are well known. The novice stabs the child to death. Then they hungry, hungrily excuse me, drink the child's blood and compete with one another as they divide his limbs. 
Through this victim, they are bound together, and the fact that they all share the knowledge of the crime pledges them to silence. Forget that when the Roman guard went to arrest Jesus, like, put the miracles and bullshit aside, like the actual guy walking around Palestine. Forget that when they went to arrest him, a sword fight broke out. The fact that Christians themselves said that they drank, ate the body, and drank the blood of Jesus, that was all any pagan needed to hear, and a stream of insurgent stereotypes would flow through her head. As time went on, of course, sadly, some Christians were victorious. And they did what is often done to people once handed the keys to the car doors of power. They turned around and threw these very slanders at those people that they disagreed with. Certain kinds of heretical and Gnostic groups. Now, when I say heretic and Gnostic, I mean that with a, with a lowercase h and a lowercase g. Because... When you read the Gnostic and heretical literature, they were saying the same things about what we would call Orthodox Christians. It was all, everybody, in the beginning, everybody was an asshole. It's really the best way to look at it. Everybody was slandering each other. Everybody was claiming that their group was correct. Even the Valentinians, which was a quote-unquote heretical sect, they couldn't even get along so well. They ended up splitting into the Eastern and Western Church. Everybody threw this slander at each other. The, the, what we today would call Orthodox Christianity, or mainstream Christianity, just so happened to be the group that won these fights. That's all it is. We, we could easily be Marcionites today. We could be Valentinians today. We could be any number of very, well, not we, probably nobody in this room, <laughs> but the larger world outside could probably be any one of these other Gnostic or quote-unquote Gnostic or quote-unquote heretical groups. They just did not win the fight. So these Christian insurgents would take these ideas and they would throw them at these other people. And... They would add something new to it, however. See, when pagans were slandering Christians, they just had a, a child's blood. They just, any, any kid that was there. What Christians said about heretic or groups they found to be heretical uh, was that they would hold orgies first, incestuous orgies, wait some time, and what, nine months <laughs> to be specific, and when the child was born, that's where they would get the kid to, to get the blood from. Uh, they also said that the devil would oversee these rites. It reads something like this. A guy named Michael Sellos wrote a, uh, a treatise called The Operation of Demons. And he wrote, when, and just in brackets, he gets into it more, the orgy is complete, um, but I wanted to spare you all that. Each member of the Bogomile, that's what he's talking about, a group, uh, they were from Thrace, goes home, and after waiting nine months, the time when the children of such an unnatural seed is born, they come together at the same place. Then on the third day after the birth, they tear the miserable babies from their mother's arms. They cut their tender flesh all over with sharp knives and catch the dripping blood in basins. They throw the babies, still breathing and gasping, onto the fire to be burnt to ashes. After which they mix the ashes with the blood in the basins and thus make an abominable drink with which they secretly pollute their food and drink. One of the things, despite all the differences of these, of these various groups, Gnostic and heretical groups, that one thing many of them shared in common was the same thing, uh, was a, excuse me, was a, a Eucharist, just like the Orthodox Christians had. Sometimes, and we have some records, particularly from Irenaeus, uh, sometimes these were entheogenic Eucharists. I'm just going to do this to avoid that whole thing from happening again. Um, move the mess around. And it, it made it easier to say that they were, that those Eucharists were con contained the blood of these children and such. But one of the things about this stereotype, and it wasn't just the Bogomil, they said this about the Polycians, they would say it about the Waldensians, they said it about the Marcionites, the Marcosians, every different kind of group they disagreed with. But because of this stereotype, we are able to draw real history, real authentic material from some of the sources. It appears every time, if a person is writing about a group and it deviates a little bit, you're probably looking at authentic material. 
around 1022 in Orleans, um, there was a group that reportedly would drink some kind of poison in their rites. And unlike Michael Sellos, who wrote on the operation of demons, and other Christian authors who were demonizing these various groups they thought were heretical, this particular group in Orleans actually had somebody infiltrate them. They had a Christian knight infiltrate their rites and write a report about what they were doing. Unfortunately, his name was Arfist. Um, that document does not survive history, sadly. So we don't know everything that this first-hand eyewitness, you know, account uh, said. But we do have a later account written by a guy named Pierre de Chatra, who clearly used Arthas' uh, report as a source for his later interpretation of what's going on. But what's amazing with it is that in that instance, you get to see both sides of the fence. You get to see the authentic history side and the stereotype put on the other like put on top of it uh, and it's a lot of fun uh, I spent a lot of nights like teasing all this stuff out in, in all these documents it's I don't have a life though so it was <laughs> it was fun for me um, but uh, this group apparently did use uh, entheogenic Eucharist is anyone not familiar with that term entheogen oh, okay it's uh, when somebody uses what we would today call a psychedelic drug to commune with the, you know, the, those forces beyond the veil. Uh, it was coined by Carl Ruck, uh, and it just means generating the gods within, or generating God within, and theogenic, in the generation of gods. And when we're, and we are going to get back to the witch stereotype, but this is kind of leading up to it, it looks something like this. You have the authentic side. This is from Arfast's report. It, this is the, uh, um, the heretics, we know their names, uh, Leosis, excuse me, saying to him, saying to Arthas, when you have fed on the heavenly food and have achieved inner satisfaction, you will be filled with the gift of, should say satisfaction, you will be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will teach you the true dignity and secret meaning of the scriptures, along with true virtue. Oh, there's the satisfaction. <laughs> I told you, and I, I, I suck with electronics. You will see, and the fact that I got it this far is pretty remarkable. Um, you will see angelic visions with us, and sated by that comfort, you will be able to go where you will. You will desire nothing, for the omnipotent God is the treasure of all wisdom, and the shine of those riches will never fade. That has nothing to do with the insurgent or heretical stereotype. It comes from an authentic source from a person that infiltrated the group and had this experience. Later on, uh, Pierre de Chartres wrote after this, and I will tell you how these people confected the meal which they call heavenly. And here's the stereotype. They hold orgies and regard that intercourse as a holy and religious work. On the eighth day, they lit a great fire among them, and the child born of this foul union is put to the flames. The ashes are collected, and anyone who tasted it was scarcely ever able to direct his mind away from heresy and back to truth. So that's what it looks like when you have authentic material mixed in with the stereotype. That is the first part of the witch stereotype. We now know where that idea that they ate babies and drank their blood and made their magical ointments out of their blood, you know, to fly to the... We know where that comes from. It comes from this ancient stereotype. Those ointments, uh, by and large, were created um, out of um, what we today would call psychedelics. And in my book addresses that and I go through a whole lot of recipes and some things that haven't even been translated into English until I did um, because I wanted to know what was going on which brings us straight into the Middle Ages and the medieval magician and Satanism with the Crusades bringing back the treasures of ancient Greece and Rome came Eastern ceremonial magic Part of this magic did involve invoking a daemon, 
A daemon was a neutral spirit. It wasn't an evil thing the way people think of demons today. You could invoke a daemon to like help an old person cross the street with their groceries. You could also invoke a daemon to kill that person with, you know, a bolt of lightning. Any magician then or today will tell you it was all about intent. What did you intend to do? When this first made its way back into Western Christendom at the time, it wasn't necessarily illegal yet. A guy named Pedro Alfonso, uh, who wrote in his The Scholar's Guide, um, Dicaplina Coricalis is the Latin, the seven liberal arts, dialectics, arithmetic, geometry, physics, music, astronomy, and necromancy. They don't get too deep into, unfortunately for us, of how people do. They just said something like necromancy is about gaining information from the dead. How somebody went about doing this, they don't really talk about because they were speaking to audiences who knew what was going on. So they don't give too much by way of detail, sadly. So nobody cared. There was another guy, it was the, uh, the, I believe it was the Archbishop of Toledo, a guy named uh, Gundisa Linus, who um, would uh, also write uh, about magic and these kinds of um, practices, saying that magic was not good or evil. It was just a vanity of life. Nothing more than enjoying fine clothing or, you know, having a luxury. Nobody, it was not yet illegal. And in fact, astronomy was never made illegal, all the way up to John Dee practicing astronomy in the English courts. So it wasn't that big a deal yet. It was going to become a big deal a little bit later on, about 40 years later, in uh, uh, St. Vincent's um, De Scallion. Uh, where he wrote, Magic is the mistress of every form of inequity and malice, lying about the truth and truly affecting a person's mind. Magic seduces them from divine religion, prompts them to the cult of demon, foists corruption of morals, and impels the mind of its devotee to every sin and criminal indulgence. So we're starting to see more negative ideas about magic, although again, still not necessarily illegal. Not something people would go about saying openly, but not something that was going to get your ass burned at the stake either. This would change two centuries later with um, uh, uh, Pope John Paul the Twenty Second. Excuse me, Pope John Jesus. Pope John the Twenty Second in thirteen twenty six wrote a papal bull um, titled "Upon My Observations," when he says many Christians are such a name only. However, they make pacts with the devil, sacrifice to demons, create images, rings, mirrors, files, or other things for the magical arts. Now magic was actually condemned. And in a sense, if somebody was brought into the Inquisition, if somebody was being inquested for heresy, and found totally innocent of heresy, that person could now be retried as a magician and that was now heretical. Magic was now a heresy. Which brings us finally to folk magic and the misogyny of the church and how they constructed this satanic witch. But a lot of it doesn't make sense unless you know, there's an understanding of the heretical stereotype and also the idea that magicians are always acting yeah, because they're invoking demons, they're always acting for evil purposes. So, folk magic. Folk magic took on a variety of forms all throughout the Middle Ages, early modern period, and Renaissance. And different women had different specialties. Uh, we sometimes are fond of saying things like wise women as a kind of a broad term, but they were specialists in their fields. Uh, for example, a one wise woman as a general term, was clearly a shaman, and her, you know, her name, Pierina de Brippio. And I go over her trial and everything in the book. She was tried in 1384 uh, by the Inquisition, and it was determined, unfortunately, that she was a heretic, because she was worshipping a fertility goddess. This was a time that everything, the, the world was very black and white. You had God and Jesus on one side, and Satan on the other. And if it wasn't God and Jesus, it was automatically defaulted to the devil. And this was even more horrible because it was a female goddess. 
perish the thoughts. Pierina was accustomed to falling into a trance. We don't know how she did it because her first trial record from 1384 is gone. But she was tried for, and I quote, relapsed heresy a few years later. And some things from the first, some, some details from the first trial are brought into the second. Pierina would, in order to meet up with her fertility goddess, would turn into a fox, a zombie, or a donkey to enter the spirit realm. We don't today know why she turned into a fox. There was probably some kind of highly localized, you know, uh, folk right, but we, we don't know why, and it's a shame. Uh, we don't. As far as the zombie and donkey, we know exactly why she did that. She would turn into a zombie because all, well, not all, but many, and hers in particular, fertility goddess society was a dead society. All of these people, they, so it would be uh, uh, um, congregated by the dead. So she would have to take on the guise of a corpse in order to enter into the spirit realm to meet with her goddess, who would teach her the virtue of herbs, how to heal, how to prophecy, uh, gems and things like that. So straight up shamanism. Um, as far as the donkey is concerned, we also know why that was. In her religion, there, it's, it's odd because a lot of these pagan ideas had Christianity built into it. Uh, according to her record, she would become a donkey because she thought that a donkey helped Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha to be crucified. That was part of the heresy. Heresy wasn't always a big thing. That thing alone, that concept doesn't exist anywhere in the New Testament. So that's the heresy. Despite the fact that Jesus rode a donkey triumphantly into Jerusalem, and Mary rode a donkey to Bethlehem to give birth, had she said either one of those reasons, it wouldn't have been such a harsh penalty because at least that's found in the Bible. So heresy is anything not found in the New Testament, or in some cases, the Old Testament. Uh, there was also Finicella, who was a witch in Rome, who we don't know why she would turn herself into a cat, <laughs> but she used a what we would call psychedelic ointment to do so. The guy who uh, uh, Bernardino of Siena, who wrote about her, was clear about this, that she would turn in herself into a cat, but he doesn't mention anything about why that was done. He does say that she, and this is going to sound familiar, she killed her own son and burnt the body and put the ashes into a drink to give to people for part of her heretical group. But of course, that's just the heretical stereotype, just playing into the record. Uh, what's interesting, I think, about it is that Bernardino of Siena, I've read a, like his, his catalog of sermons, he never hesitated to exaggerate anything. I mean, he was so full of shit, I mean, it was coming out of his ears. And, no, like, really. And the fact that he attributed a psychedelic ointment to this cat transformation uh, is very telling because he was the kind of person that was prone to say, oh yeah, I watched her just do it magically, but instead he straight up says, no, she was using one of those hallucinogenic ointments to do it. These ideas would make their way into some texts. For example, in the book they turgeoned um, by a guy named Hans Wittler, um, shows a, uh, that, that means the, the Book of Virtues, um, shows a woman turning into a cat, and then Ulrich Molitor, who wrote the Amis, which is this very obscure way of saying which, I have not yet found where that word comes from. I've been, I've looked for years. I don't, I don't know where it comes from, but it does mean witches. And that's where we kind of see that witch stereotype right there. They're flying on a stick, they're in animal disguise. There's the storm in the background because they were raising storms to destroy crops. So that is the pictorial representation of the witch stereotype in its earliest form, and that's why it's the cover of the book. And um, so this kind of practice is now being demonized because all magic was demonized with that papal bull upon my observations. So they had pretty much ran out of magicians, or run out of magicians to burn, and yet everything still sucked. There was still famine, 
there was still plague, there were still diseases of all kinds. And this was supposed to be a loving God, right? So how is all this shit going down? Well, there has to still be witches. There must still be people that are invoking the devil. And that's why all this stuff is happening around them. The earliest um, writing of this witch stereotype, however, does not appear in a demonology treatise or a witch hunting manual but in the trial record of Matucha de Francesca Las Riga de Casa Ripebianca. She's somewhat of the main character of my book. The entire book is a deconstruction of her trial record showing how all of these things formed. And just like the heretics of Orleans, there's that fence put up where you can see the authentic material on one side and the bullshit and the stereotypes on the other. Matucha specialized in love magic. I said earlier that, there, that all of these, you know, as a broad term, wise women did have specialties. Uh, Piorina's specialty was shamanism. Uh, Finicella, the cat woman, her, her specialty was uh, podiatry, which again lent her to serious accusations because she dealt with, she, oh, she was a pediatrician, excuse me. Um, <laughs> wow. Sorry. Um, but, but that lent itself, because of the fact that she worked with children, that lent itself to these stereotypes. Matucha was a love magic specialist, so she dealt with affairs of the heart. Uh, one of her more popular spells she did um, involved selling a drug and an incantation to abused housewives. The, the wife would secretly put the drug into her husband's food, like dinner or something, wait for about an hour or so, 45 minutes to an hour, just when he started to sweat and got a little dizzy. But before the hallucinations kicked in, she was then instructed, the, the wife was instructed to say this incantation over her husband as he lay cowing from the hallucinations. And he would think that she was causing this and that any time she said this incantation, <laughs> this would happen to him. And it caused many an abusive asshole to behave himself later on in life. Um, she was also a physician in some ways. Uh, she specialized in a, a form of sympathetic magic as well, uh, sympathetic uh, medicinal magic. Uh, one guy came to her who had a bum leg and um, she, uh, we don't know how it happened, but it, it was getting in the way of him working and walking around and everything. So she mixed 30 different herbs into a potion, threw it into a street, and the idea was that the potion would, would grasp onto his throbbing leg and lay dormant until somebody passed by and then release his throbbing knee into the next person. So that was another form of folk magic. And we, all of this appears in the authentic side of her trial record. What's interesting is that when it gets to the point of her magical ointment that she used to enter a trance and, apparent, and incidentally turn herself into a mouse, to fly to the walnut tree in Benevento, that's where it was said that you know these different uh, people would gather to have this, this magical experience and to worship the great goddess, the mother goddess of yore. These are, a lot of these have to do with fertility goddess worship. That's when the record takes a really sharp turn and they throw the stereotype onto her. So you can see again, both sides of the fence. And what I thought was, was for me really cool was that we actually capture in the record her chant that she would say while covering herself with the ointment. It appears on the authentic side. And it looks like this was her chance. She would say, ointment, ointment, take me to the walnut tree in Benevento, over water, over wind, over all bad weather. And then she would turn into a mouse. And then there's a break in the record. And she was tortured. And when they resumed the inquest, suddenly she's saying, oh yeah, I continue chanting, oh Lucibel, demon of hell, after you were released, you change your name and have the name of the of great Lucifer come to me. We're now seeing the stereotype. Anyone want to take a guess what they said her ointment was made out of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
the flesh and blood of murdered children. Right? So this is that stereotype. They're just now throwing it onto wise women. Women, unfortunately, were a very easy target in these days because they lacked, especially medicine women, many of them lacked credentials. And when you read in the records, a lot of the times people were, well, people, men, were saying that they were not educated enough. But yet, when you look at what they were doing and also market against what the, uh, excuse me, well, theologians in some cases were uh, trained in medicine, but what trained um, physicians were doing and what wise women were doing was very much the same thing. But it's that they were women, and God forbid a woman practice medicine, of course. Like, no, really, God forbid a woman <laughs> practice medicine. <laughs> well, get your ass burned at the stake. So, this stereotype thrown onto these women would cause the, the, the larger stereotype, excuse me, stereotype today of a witch being a woman, which is why we normally today, like when Halloween comes around, all the decorations have a woman flying on a broom. That is the witch stereotype. Still working on our minds today. So is, incidentally, the fact that they were elderly women. We don't know how old Matucha was. We have no idea. So don't think old woman. She could have been in her 20s. We don't know. And in other records where age is listed, people from both genders of every age practiced magic. The reason they went after old women had to do with medical theory at the time. Once women stopped mentioning, this has to do with four humors theory of medicine that the person has, cool, some people have. Um, the four humors theory, the fact that they could no longer, once they went through menopause, they were no longer discharging bad blood. So it would just kind of brew inside them, this evil blood, right? And that, that's why today we think of witches as elderly women, believe it or not. So stop thinking like medieval Christians, all of you. <laughs> we get to see this in editions of manuscripts, this demonization of these folk magic practitioners, these wise women, into this satanic witch. Very notably, in um, there was that, that picture a few uh, slides ago, De La Mise, with the witches on the, on the stick flying through the air. This is another woodcut from that book. And just take a look at it for a second. This is from 1489. This is the first edition of De La Mis. They're just doing, there's uh, the, the serpent that they use, chickens, things like that. Four years later, because the book was a success, it was, we today would call it a bestseller, there was another edition put out four years later, in uh, 1493, 94, I mean these dates were all kind of eh, shaky. Uh, but it was a 1493, 1494, and this same woodcut appears in that manuscript. Anyone notice a difference? Oh, then they edge, huh? Yeah. And yeah. now, now they, they reverse too. Now the one on the left has the snake and the one on the right has a chicken. That yes. <laughs> that is definitely a difference. But there's also a difference in how they look, no? Look at yeah, their faces again. They're old and they have that. Yeah. yeah. This, they're just very, it's a very blank expression here. Now they like it. Now they're... Now, <laughs> yeah. Now they look horrific, right? Now they look like these terrible, you know, bitches of the devil, so to speak. That's what they look like. So that is the stereotype of the witch. That is what it looks like in the manuscripts. When you look at the first editions of these texts in the woodcuts, a lot of them look like this. All the later editions look like this or worse. That's our stereotypical witch. It is a mixture of th fear, theological fears about heresy, uh, anxieties about ritual magic and the invoking of demons, fertility goddess worship, because, come on, can't have any kind of feminine spirituality. I actually was told that I got somebody didn't show up tonight because she, you know, gender typified me as a guy, so I'm not allowed to talk about this stuff, <laughs> apparently. Um, oh well, to each their own, right? 
Um, but this is, uh, this is essentially where it came from, this idea of the stereotypical witch. It, it's all of these things built into one. Um, so when we think about witches and witchcraft today, again, we need not necessarily default to old women or anything like that, or even necessarily women. Mm -hmm. um, up until about the 1300s, at least in uh, Christian Europe, the majority of witches burned, or the majority of people burned for practicing magic were men. They didn't care about this stuff yet. Mm -hmm. This was just what, what you know, uh, folk <laughs> practitioners were doing. Nobody really gave a shit yet. It was only after they had really put the hammer down on the, the, or excuse me, the ceremonial male magicians and shit still kept happening that they decided, oh, it must be these women. They were so, like, they were actually so misogynistic that they didn't even think women had these capabilities. Like, that's how dumb they were. Like, yeah. <laughs> and that's how dumb <laughs> some of them still are today. <laughs> Just say, but that's the stereotypical witch. Uh, no, that's right. Yeah. So at this point, there wasn't any sort of like femme fatale or seductress element to it at all. Oh, uh, there were in some senses. Um, people, uh, a lot of these women would, and and again, men. I'm see that's the witch stereotype working on me too. Would con uh, would concoct what were known as poculamatori in the Latin, which means a love filter. We today would call it ecstasy. These were magic potions that had usually man mandrake, opium. Uh, if you ask Chris Bennett, he would say cannabis is in there, and it would probably, and a host of other things. Uh, one of the problems with the texts is that, uh, or at least for me, was I wanted to know like the, the psychedelic side of it and what they were really using. Mm -hmm. But theologians in those days didn't give a shit. They would use a general term which just means wene, which means poison. We get the word venom from wene. There, there's no V in Latin, so it's, it's V-E-N-E, -E, but it's pronounced like a W. So I have mm -hmm. W's, two V's, but yeah. Um, so just say wene. It, every now and then, though, uh, like Gene Vincent, for example, he wrote, uh, was it Gene Vincent? No. Um, it was a guy named Borgano, excuse me, who wrote, uh, he says specifically that mandrake was one of the ingredients in these love filters. Another guy named uh, Cristobal de Acosta, it's kind of funny because he was writing about the opium in these potions, and he said that um, if you're an intelligent person, you shouldn't take it because you already have a strong imagination, and men, you will not be able to please your woman because you'll ejaculate too fast. <laughs> so only really insipid men should use these so that it gives them some semblance of an imagination so that they can actually <laughs> please their woman before they ejaculate. <laughs> Admit to using them then. What's that? <laughs> Who would even admit to oh, using them? Oh, it wasn't them? illegal. Oh, okay. It wasn't. E it was not illegal yet. The, but what it it was. Like. It was the intention. It was only illegal to use these substances to worship a fertility goddess. Okay. We have all like, uh, for example, so the concept of the animal transformation to enter the spirit world. We have reports of guys who would take these same ointments and potions and walk around town all day, flapping their wings and pecking the ground like a duck or a goose or something. There was no problem with that. Nobody, nobody cared. <laughs> so, well, that's what you look, you know, that's before TV, radio, the internet. I think it's personally <laughs> better than the internet. I mean, it's more interesting, but that's what you did for entertainment. On a boring Saturday, you drink a potion and walk around pretending you're a duck. But there was another case that um, a, my mentor and a colleague of mine um, dug up from Wittenberg, Germany, where these girls took a, a a magic piece of bread that probably had ergot. We don't know what the drug was, but ergot is the base element of LSD. The idea was to turn into cows so that they could fly to a witch dance and celebrate, you know, the pagan rites of old. One of the girls ended up having what we would call a bummer, and the girl who supplied the bread was tried for witchcraft because they were. This had to do with fertility goddess worship. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it depended on the intent. Sir. There was also some allegory about the, uh, the presence of Urgot during the Salem witch trials as well. And there was, uh, there's, I've heard uh, it said that that might have a lot to do with um, the, uh, the alleged uh, red birds and, and all these hallucinations that they saw there. Um, uh, it, oddly, I, I disagree. Uh, with that, um, with the idea that Urgot. I'm curious to know. Yeah. Um, one of the problems with, like, the, the trials, I mean, the Salem trials are one of the best documented that we have. And 
the people uh, who were experiencing these convulsions and hallucinations, which is why people thought Ergot was involved, only seemed to have those convulsions and hallucinations in the courtroom. Mm. And I don't know if anyone here has taken LSD before, but you can't turn it off and on. <laughs> and so it, they were, it was uh, the, the young ladies, uh, the, the girls who accused uh, Tichaba of these, of, these, um, of these practices, they would only, you know, they would have the convulsions, they, they were acting out. I mean, again, highly patriarchal society, these poor kids were, you know, very much repressed, and this was their way of just acting out and releasing their frustrations, uh, or at least that's my take on it. Um, when you get to, like, the, the trials that I looked at, I mean, you can really tell when there is an actual drug in play because the person can't turn it on and off at will mm -hmm. just because somebody is there. Yeah, like the person that they're condemning is there. If you're um, really dripping balls. You're gonna, yeah, exactly. You you're can't, in it for like a good eight hours. Probably. Yeah, you're, you're, you're in it. You're in it for the long haul. Um, in some cases, and I, and I write about them in the book, I mean, they did use ergot, and it was like the, the descriptions are of, you know, having hallucinations and seeing devils, and when they investigated the actual, like, potion bottle, they would find the, uh, the little bits of ergot at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And, like, it, it's recorded that they were in there, and, and the, the person who supplied it in case it's a case by case thing sometimes they were executed sometimes they were reprimanded um there was no universal witch like anti-witch law like for example i, I spoke about matuccia de francesco she was an italian witch in it, it or i hate to say witch because she wasn't really a witch she was a, a love magic specialist really and a fertility goddess worshiper and um with that whole, she, her flying to the walnut tree of Benevento, in the record it says that Satan was there instead. But again, that's just the heretical stereotype brought into the magical stereotype, the ceremonial magical stereotype, and then crushed down on these wise women. Um, I'll take plenty of questions, because uh, I think that's the end of the slides, so if anyone has any questions, uh, more. Well, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there. All of this is laid out um, in the book, um, and this is going towards funding a documentary uh, for well, a, a short trailer to be shot to production companies um, and uh, trying to get it on the History Channel, National Jury. Sir. I guess I just have one question. Uh, no, please, please, please. This is what I do. I love it. Um, how did the broomsticks come into play, do you think? And um, is there any um, sort of phallic aspect to that at all? None whatsoever. Okay, so, yeah. you know, I've heard, uh, heard these rumors that women would, you know, take these ointments um, into their bodies using yeah. broomsticks. That, that claim <laughs> originally... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> all history begins with a source. And there's, there just isn't a source. Now, like, when I first started this research ten years ago, I thought I, I thought that because it's all over the internet. Like if you go, you know, with that it'll say that. Um, they also will never provide a source because there isn't one. Um, the claim was invented in 1973 by a guy named Michael Harner in a book called Hallucinogens and Shamanism. Uh, he wrote it, it's a, a collection of essays by different people about uh, you know uh, psychedelics and entheogens all over the world, and he was one of the first to really try to tackle this. And it's a great article. Absolutely, but it, it's a little out of date today. He offered that as conjecture. He thought maybe that has some, you know, maybe that's the whole thing. And, and because we're in the age of the internet, you know, people just share the idea and, you know, something, it, it becomes true, you know, over time. Um, every record I looked at, and I looked at hundreds of them, they were just using their fingers or a pessary. The concept of the broom, where that idea comes from is very difficult to nail down. Because they were saying that women were flying on brooms. In fact, in one of the first, I'll go back a little bit. Um, going backwards in history, I'm pointing out the wrong thing. That first picture of um, the Waldensian heretics, the Vaudri as they were called, you can see in the sky women flying on brooms. Getting warmer. 
<laughs> like the pits of hell warmer, boom. There was, uh, yeah. See, like that one all the way on the side, you could see her, she's on a broom. I thought I saw him in one of the other images too, perhaps. Oh, possibly, yeah. So what it comes down to is, like, we don't know where it came from, but when they would talk about male witches, it would be things like um, shovels, plows, so-called man instruments, you know. Sure. When it came to women, it had to do with brooms, the so-called domestic instruments. So domestic. And as the stereotype focused more on women only, the broom became the standard. But where the idea itself comes from is really like, I, I would, I'd be so happy if those records would come to light. And they might one day, you know, this is, we don't, it might be just sitting there waiting in an archive for somebody to find it. Um, we don't know why, although in the 1200s, a guy named Stephen of Bourbon said, and in this very obscure phrase, he said that good women rode on brooms, evil women rode on wolves. We don't know why, one way or the other. Again, uh, one of the problems with a lot of these documents is that people are writing to those who n already know what they're talking about. So they don't go into too much detail. Um, it's really what you can tease from what's there. And that's why I said at the beginning, I'm not reconstructing anything. A reconstruction means that I have all the pieces. But I don't have all the pieces. And nobody has all the pieces. And... Um, Every colleague of mine, every scholar I know that deals with this has no idea why it was said people did this. There was a guy named um, Raymond Buckland um, who wrote a, 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 I forget the title of his book, but he said that there was some rite where people would jump on brooms around corn stalks, hoping for the corn to grow as high as their you know, as hard as that, total bullshit. He made that up. There, yeah. That does not appear anywhere in the historical record, which is why he doesn't provide a single source for the claim. And nothing against him, you know, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Um, and we have a lot in common, but uh, I don't, except that I won't, I won't make that leap, so to speak, on the broom. I won't come at you with something that, I, that doesn't have a source. All history begins with something there. And then you work off of it. There's there's nothing in the records about it. It just doesn't. Or if there isn't, it has not been turned up yet. But in the same sense, there is hope of finding this out because a lot of my critics said that these ointment recipes didn't exist. And there were a few of them from the 1500s, but like, oh, that was just made up by physicians. They just, that was their way of explaining it away. And then I spent 10 years in archives digging up from well before the 1500s, all of these folk recipes, and that's chapter four in the book, all these different folk recipes translated for the first time into English. Hadn't seen the light of day in about 500 years. Tripping out in the woods and doing magic makes perfect sense to me. So me I can, too. I can imagine <laughs> being something that would be carried on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh my god, are you asking me out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm single. What are you doing in the woods later? <laughs> Actually, I have three questions. Uh, Please. Um, first of all, are you going? Are you touring? Or yes. are you going around? This was my first stop on a tour. Are you going to Portland? Uh, I I just gave a talk in Portland. Oh, okay, okay. Then my friend probably saw you. Um, and second, uh, have you seen the juniper tree? And what do you think of um, like how that was presented? The juniper tree? Uh, no, I'm not familiar. It's a black and white, um, I think that's the name, right? It's a Bjork, it's a witchcraft movie. Oh, I've not it's seen really, it. really stark, uh, very, um, yeah, it's real stark. I don't know, it, 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 it was really stripped down, but it had some interesting ideas, and I wondered how based in, you know, research. Uh, I'll check it out, I haven't uh, seen it. Um, what I found is most of the, the popular ideas um, are, are based off of the witch stereotype. Um, one of the talks that I gave here twice was like really focused more and narrowed it down. I mean, it was more about the witch's ointment itself because that's what my area of research is. Um, and just like that article that I was talking about uh, written in 1973 by Michael Harner that invented that, that was a lot of that stuff was made from the platform of the witch stereotype without going behind it to see what it was based on. But 
I'll definitely check. I haven't seen it, so anything I would say about it's, it would be it's, ignorant. It's good. It's, it's really... Uh, God, who's that director, the old black and white guy? Oh, come on, help me. Uh, Death playing chess with... Uh, Bergman. Yeah, Bergman. It's very Bergman in my Oh, opinion. yeah? Yeah. Uh, my third question, do you mind if I take your picture? Not at all. Okay. For uh, <laughs> like a... <laughs> all right. I'm going to post it to our chapter page. Cool. By all means. Um, um, do you see this like whole process of the stereotype and whatnot uh, today in any way? Of course. Uh, yeah. 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 Mind, yeah. Was it you? Oh, yeah. No, every everybody stereotypes. It, it it just has to do with human beings are very much tribal by nature, very xenophobic, and it's just that fear of the other. Mm -hmm. All people stereotype each other. Um, it's it's about recognizing that and tempering it, really, and realizing that what you might believe about somebody you don't know is probably a load of shit <laughs> and might not have abs you know have no bearing in the reality of who that person actually is so um knowing this kind of stuff and doing this kind of research um it, it really it puts it at the forefront at least for me it put it at the forefront of just how much uh, people will base their ideas off of ideas that they know nothing about like when I was talking about uh, Michael Sellos and the operation of demons um, when he was saying like he had never met a single boga mill in his life you know this was just it came to him third hand from somebody and he just decided it was true and I think that that is something that really kind of um, pervert society even still today yeah. is hearing something second third hand and just deciding it's true and not really bringing you know not looking at things critically sometimes shortcut for thinking yeah, yeah. of course <laughs> I guess um, my question kind of piggybacks on what she was asking uh, the whole breeding children for uh, ritual sacrifice and consuming them it sounds a lot like the satanic panic. It sounds modern, yeah. shockingly so. And yeah. I was wondering if there were any other parallels you noticed. It's um, funny because in my talk in Portland, somebody brought that yeah. up as well. And uh, yeah, these are just the same bullshit stereotypes that Christians have been throwing at people for centuries. And were there organized efforts to find these perpetrators like in mass? Or was it typically just based on um, the word of the accuser? I, from what I understand about it, it was all just a lie, right? From the 80s and 90s, is that what you're talking about? Like the, oh, yeah, the, yeah, okay. the satanic panic? That it was all just nonsense. It was yeah. a lot of people just really, you know, taking the ball and running with it and just, you know, having these ideas. I mean, they're still with us today. I mean, clearly, and we still see it today. Yeah. Sir, I'm your witness. Uh, oh, <laughs> the, uh, all the stereotype stuff actually... God applied to Jews, and a lot of it's identical to what they are using with Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the, unfortunately, there's this body of records from the late 1300s that we know, or that historians know existed, that deals with the Jewish, like, like the, the implementation of these stereotypes from Jews onto witches, or, or wise women, shamanists, love magicians, things like that. Um, and we unfortunately it doesn't come down to us there's a, a great um a scholar named carlo ginsburg he teaches at ucla now um he has a chapter in his book called ecstasies deciphering the witch's sabbath and he puts it together uh better than anyone certainly better than i could but again the, the, those records are by and large gone uh there are some surviving records that does talk about that do talk about jews bleeding out babies and you know in their secret meetings and stuff but how they like that bridge between jews and wise women those records are like they just have not survived the passages of time sadly and if they have no one has discovered them yet and again history like we're always coming up with you know things are always being discovered so there is a chance that some somebody somewhere took those records, wrote them down in another, you know, form somewhere else, and they're just waiting to be dug up. Uh, but so far, not as yet. But you are absolutely correct that they did do that to Jews as well. Uh, I'm curious why you focus so much on witches. Like, what is it about? 
Well, it wasn't so much uh, the witches. So my my main interest is in psychedelic and entheogenic history. And while I was writing my undergraduate uh, thesis, uh, which had to do with uh, the um, uh, Timothy Leary and, and the, the psychedelic 60s uh, and all that kind of stuff, I came across in, in, in a, uh, a, a reference to these witches' ointments in a book uh, called The Alchemy of Culture by a, a man named Richard Rudgley. It's been uh, reissued uh, as a, a, the new title, oh, what's it? Essential Substances. And it was just a kind of page like, wow, this is, this is so cool, but it, was, it didn't pertain to my area of interest. And then in my master's degree, I focused on the CIA LSD tests and things like that, because, and pretty much the LSD revolution of the 1950s. I didn't even know there was an LSD because everybody <laughs> focuses on the 60s, mostly because, you know, there's television and radio then, but not a, there was television and radio in the 50s, of course, as well, but not everybody had access to them. So I and I was like, wow, and, and it just kind of blew this door open in my mind. I'm like, oh, I thought that you know it was just an idea. It goes back earlier in the '50s, and I just I wanted to know where you know where does this begin? Um, one of the reasons today that we associate a lot of psychedelic culture with Eastern traditions and stuff like that and like home and doing yoga and stuff and that's great and I have no problem you know with that at all but it, it's it's because people didn't know about this yet they didn't know that there was a Western tradition mm -hmm. so I started doing just a little bit of research into this witch's ointment and it got to a point where all the texts were in Latin so I was like oh fuck so I, I had to stop my research teach myself Latin for three years and then keep going with the research um, but it's all it's all in there it's it's all like it's there there is a very rich history there and um, I like I had no idea at the time when I started this that this was just a bastardization of fertility goddess worship and that how much of it really had to do with misogyny I had no idea I just like um, you've probably heard of like flying ointments and that I, that's all I thought it was. it was like oh it was you know kind of like a psychedelic trip you know so when I went into my research that's all I thought there was and then when I was finally able to read the actual texts and the founding documents uh, that's why I suck with computers by the way and all this stuff is I spent my time learning a dead language <laughs> instead um, <laughs> I, I realized that there was so much more to the story than just a flying ointment. There's there was a lot more to it, and that all these stereotypes played into it, and it essentially got to a point where they just ran out of people to burn, and yet the world still sucked. So it must be witches. It says I I, I forget what the verse is in the Old Testament, but it says there must be witches, and so when people were reading, it's like okay, we gotta find them. <laughs> <laughs> At least today they burned the books and not the authors, so that's good. So I'm safe. Well, my book isn't safe, but I am. Yes. Speaking of flying, so why were the women um, turning into cows to fly somewhere or a mouse to fly somewhere? It just had to do with this with spirit animals mm -hmm. and and that thing. For example, um, the the. It's odd because we again. I was talking about how we don't know where the fox comes from. We do know the fertility goddess's name. Her name was Madame Oriente. The fox was a sacred animal, spirit animal of her, and with the mingling of Christian ideas into it, that's where the donkey comes from. And that's why I, I mean, ultimately, we don't know. And I hate to say that, but we really don't know why. They felt that you could, you, you had to transform to enter the spirit world. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, I'd love to give you a, a better answer, but I can't without being totally full of shit. Maybe anybody who's tripped out with cats around would understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, yeah, but it's, <laughs> they seem to, uh, I don't know, non-human creatures seem to have a bit more connection with uh, <laughs> what seems like the something beyond the veils yeah. than we do a lot of the time. <laughs> it's funny because I love cats so much. Oh man, I'm a total kitty person. Um, <laughs> My roommates actually called me Tomcat. Uh, it's funny. I was at a, uh, a conference at uh, Western Michigan University, and I was going over a lot of this stuff. And one of the other speakers was talking, and he, he had mentioned how um, one of the things that people said separated humans from animals was the practice of magic. 
to which I raised my hand, I had a question. I said, how can that be when kitty cats are the most magical beings ever? <laughs> they really, you, uh, somebody put it this way, cats are the one creature out there that know, that is aware of their divinity. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, they are. <laughs> and the boars that dig up the uh, psychedelic roots and trip out too. There you go, yeah, the, the big pigs. Yeah. <laughs> We actually have like a cat goddess altar in our house. Oh, yeah? Like, cool. Psychedelic embroidered cat. Yeah. Oh. That's awesome. <laughs> have either of you guys heard of the artist Louis Wayne? I have not. Oh, French artist who uh, allegedly was, uh, was proclaimed schizophrenic. Um, his oh, they say that about all of us. <laughs> his specialty was uh, he, well, the thing that's most prevalent in his artwork was. Um, uh, cats. He does these amazing uh, pictures of cats. A lot of them are like kind of doing human things, like playing croquet or something like that, you know. But um, it sort of seems like uh, further through his art, art career, um, he got kind of crazier and crazier with the cats. And eventually, like he had these pictures where it just looks like a multitude of vibrational energies, kind of, kind of coming together in the form of a cat. Cosmic kittens. Oh, I mean, represented by like just vibrant patterns of color that just kind of make up a cat's face. Really yeah. crazy looking. If any of you guys are uh, from fans of the band um, Current 93, they've used Louis Wayne art with some of their album covers, and um, their singer David Tibet is really into Louis Wayne. If you've never seen them, really check it out. I, I guarantee you'll love it. It's, I, it. it's real fun to listen uh, to look at while you're like, tripping out, too, because all these cats have this like vivid look in their eyes like they're freak out. Yeah. <laughs> I really like his art a lot. Awesome. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Thanks. Pretty awesome stuff. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any <laughs> other questions? Yes. Um, so you, you found these recipes and translated them. Yes. I'm wondering if you like prepared and tried these. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 it's a cool thing to do. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, particularly the, the plants that I work with mostly are um, henbane and mandrake as far as the ones that they were using. Um, and um, mushrooms as well, although the, the records on mushroom use is scanty, although it does appear that some people were using it to transform into werewolves. That was one of the, the things that people used it for. Um, at least according uh, to uh, Jean de Ninald in uh, I think it was 1609-ish around there. Um, but, um, I, I, that was the one thing I was expecting to find far more mushroom references, but they're really not there. Um, there's today something called like, there's this whole mushroom theory of religion and everything. And, um, those people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they have no idea. Um, there, there are a few references here, but again, as I was saying before, by and large, the, the, the people writing these records did not have our concerns. So they would just write poison which depending on context means poison the way we we would use it or drug it could mean either one so that's where you have to get into the context of what they're talking about um when for example jean vincent uses the term when a he's very clearly talking about what we would call a psychedelic drug uh but he doesn't say what they are he just says you know poison or when a um but he says that it'll you know you're you're mind goes out and I mean it's weird because we have to update you know like we have to adjust for language but he's talking about what we would call like spirit travel or things like that or out of body experiences um he talks about how you know they transform into animals using these drugs and things like that and um what's interesting is that he then goes on to say that um that despite the fact that we know that these drugs do all this it's really Satan doing it <laughs> and he goes on to say that the drugs are the secondary cause and Satan is the primary cause. The, the going theory at the time was that what, the, what the, the psychedelics did was dull the mind so that Satan could more easily enter it. That was the, the theory. <laughs> Sir? Did you come across anything with like, depictions of you think that the real magic was like maybe they actually can transform into animals? Um, anything, I, any claims that they make? There, there are claims made about it, but again, they're, they're so saturated with theological bullshit 
that they're clearly just made up stories. In fact, I, I was talking about Finicella, the cat woman of Rome who used the hallucinogenic ointment. She was written about several times by later authors, and slowly but surely the ointment is written out, and it's said that she could just do it spontaneously. So if we only had that later, you know, the latest record, we would just think, oh, this is some guy talking about a woman turning into a cat. He's, you know, just making shit up, you know? But when you get to the founding record that discusses this woman, it's clear, and the, the author says she was using a hallucinogenic ointment. Or, so I don't like the word hallucinogenic, but a psychedelic ointment. It makes me think of, like, you know, Carlos Castaneda, you know, talking sure. about that and, like, even, like, like science fiction, like, darker than you think. I don't know if you ever read that. I, I'm familiar with Carlos Castaneda. I'm not, I'm, uh, as an author, I haven't really <clears throat> delved too deeply into his books because I spent the last, last decade of my life right. delving into this stuff. Um, but I am, you know, as, as a student of psychedelic history, I'm familiar with the stuff. It just didn't pertain too much to my area, so I never really got too much into his books. Um, but, uh, I, uh, so I, I really, again, I would be ignorant to make a comment on them because I haven't read them. Anybody else? So, your book, is it cash only or do you have means to take cards? I have means to take cards as well. <laughs> and that's the best question I've heard. In my <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I can, and yeah, this all goes to film the trailer and make a, a film on this to start shopping to production companies to then in turn shop to places like the History Channel or Netflix original or stuff. So um, I'd really just like there to uh, to get out there that there is a Western tradition. I think Carl Ruck did a great job with the rights of Eleusis. But if you watch any documentary about, um, you know, uh, 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 as a very neutral term, drugs in history, and I don't mean drugs is a good thing or a bad thing, yeah. they have the ancient Greece and Rome, and then they skip everything and go right to Victorian times <laughs> with the laudanum and opium, and they're like, whoa, 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 there's this whole thing. You know, I mean, um, Heinrich Cornelius von Netzerschheim, who is one of the um, more famous um, Renaissance alchemists, I mean, said openly that he used mandrake in his love filters, and he said uh, you could perform Venus ple pleasure three score and tenfold or something like that. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's stuff like that. Um, I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. It's my favorite song. <laughs> he said he teaches at a community college. That probably happens like six times a day. Yeah, I actually got to send the uh, the most awesome email I've ever sent to anyone uh, a few weeks ago. They they asked me if I'd be teaching the spring semester, and I said, "Nah, I got a book tour to go on." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm not uh, I'm not going to be teaching right. And since I'm an adjunct and not a full time, that pretty much means that when I get back, I don't have a job there. Oh wow! No, it's okay. I don't. I this is this is I I don't want to be a college professor. I want to be a historian with a show about magic and that whole thing, magic and witchcraft and history. Nice. So that's what that's I'm like going to do. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, but not always. Again, not all magic had to do with, as anybody, everybody I'm sure here knows, it doesn't. The, these substances were just, they were built in, if somebody had knowledge of them, they would be built into their practices. But, I mean, you have um, Albertus Magnus, for example, uh, writing during medieval times, did say that necromancers used henbane. They would inhale henbane and talk to the dead. And other people just said, oh, you know, that's not how they do it. They cut open animals and read their entrails. That's how it's done. And another person said, no, they just go to a graveyard and vote. Well, the truth is, all of them were right. But there were men, so only one of them could be right. Oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess it's Slightly personal question, but in your uh, experience with something like uh, mandrake or henbane, um, would you compare the overall feeling to any other particular entheogenic substance you may have? No, um, because they're so those plants to work with are a little. They're they're very dangerous because in high doses they will kill you. So mm -hmm. I have to just make sure I say that. Stick to things like you know that won't kill you, <laughs> but um. Uh, the first time I, I inhaled this fumigation, this mixture of, of 
Henbane with Mandrake, I literally went fucking crazy. Like, like, really, the room was spinning. I thought I was dying. Like, it was, I took too much because you don't need that much. Uh, this was, I don't even know how many years ago, but I, I've gotten myself used to it. One of, the, one of the things that I didn't realize at the time was that these people were used to it. They had grown up with it their whole lives, so they had a natural tolerance to it that I didn't have because I grew up with aspirin. So they could and Flintstones <laughs> vitamins. They so, take so. themselves pretty high without like, reaching a fatal point. Yeah, yeah. Because their bodies were accustomed to it. And in many cases, we have people falling into these trances without any substance whatsoever. For example, uh, the Benandanti in Italy, uh, they were able to fall into these cat catatonic trances without the aid of any psychedelic whatsoever. They were just, it had to do with just cultural programming. Mm -hmm. They had been told their entire lives that on this night, on this date, at this time, you are going to fall into this trance and go to do battle. That's what they, they would do battle against witches for the good of the crops. A lot of this has to do with fertility rights and fertility religions. Uh, I had mentioned um, Carlo, Ginsberg, Carlo Ginsberg's book earlier, uh, Ecstasies. He gets really hardcore into it. He also has an entire book on the Benedanti called The Night Battles, which I, I would recommend. In your writing, do you have some of these references? Oh, yeah. With these writers? Oh, absolutely. So one, one could read the book and, and go and cross-reference information and look absolutely. at their own research? Yep. Cool. Yep. So I'm curious. Um, if you're interested in the neurophysiology of it, like when I got into psychedelics, um, I read a lot about how they're psychomimetic, as in they yeah, plug in. Psychomimetic. Huh? Psychomimetic? Yeah, how right. they, they plug in. And I'm wondering uh, if that's something you're interested in or researching the henbane and mandrake and well parallels there. I'm not into the term psychomimetic because it, it means mimicking psychosis. Like, and I don't, that's not what these people were doing. Yeah. Um, they were having full-on entheogenic experiences. In some cases, I had to coin a term. Real quick, if you do check out my book, every time you see the word entheogen, what I really mean is extheogen. Because these people were not generating the divine within. They were generating the divine from without. When Pierina would fall into it, would turn into a fox and meet up with Madame Oriente, she was speaking to a goddess that was a being outside of herself. So I, the term didn't exist when the book was published. It does now because I invented it. <laughs> because I, I felt like entheogen didn't really describe what was going on. It was extheogenic. Anybody else? Cool. Well, I thank you all so much for listening. Um, there was a tradition in the West. It just was demonized. And uh, this was, I mean, it was really the, the first war on drugs, so to speak, was the war against this kind of fertility goddess worship. Um, the idea that the feminine could be sacred uh, was just completely torn apart and condemned. And... Um, it, it, it's a real spiritual practice, and it, it's really meant a lot in my own life. Mm -hmm. So um, it continues to this day, as much as they tried to stamp it out of Western civilization, <laughs> we're still here. Cool. Thank you so much. Cool.